So as I was uh, trying to put this talk together on nanotechnology together, I, was, I thought about something to give you a little bit of uh, context about the size and the scale of the objects that we were, were going to talk about. And uh, what it brought to uh, memory was a movie that when I was a teenager, uh, I liked a lot. I, every time it re-ran on television, I would be sit in front of the television watching the whole thing. Uh, and that movie was called Fantastic Voyage, which maybe some of you have seen. Uh, and it was interesting for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, I was a teenage boy and it starred Raquel Welch. So that was one reason. Uh, the other reason uh, was because of the cool science that was involved. So the context or the idea of that movie was there was a scientist who had a, had a blood clot uh, that was inoperable. And so uh, to, to save the scientist, uh, the uh, a crew was assembled to go inside a submarine, including a, a, a surgeon. Uh, and then the submarine was shrunk down to a very tiny size, uh, put into a syringe, and then injected into the patient, where the submarine would make its way eventually to the brain, uh, and then the surgeon would remove the clot from the inside, uh, and then there were various misadventures that would happen along the way. Um, now, the, the science in that movie was really terrible, okay? But they did get something right. Uh, they got the scale right, which is the size of something that would, you would need to have to move around inside someone's body and go to an organ and do some sort of therapeutic thing. And the scale that they uh, would be on is called the nanoscale. Uh, and if you're not used to working with uh, metric, uh, but maybe you have a ruler at home that has inches on one side and millimeters on the other, and if you took one of those little millimeters uh, sizes and you divided it by one million, you would have a nanometer, and that's, that's the scale. And so it, it helps to put the scale in perspective as to the size of the objects that, that we're discussing. So. Um, we usually, in science, we use a, a logarithmic scale because things get big and small uh, very quickly. So on the nanometer scale, uh, the very small things are at one end, and those would be things like individual molecules, for example, a water molecule, carbon dioxide, things like that. At the other end of the scale, up about 1,000 uh, micrometers, or sorry, 1,000 nanometers at one micrometer, uh, would be things like bacteria. And so uh, in between the two is where a lot of new and exciting science uh, is happening. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's a very exciting, the chemistry, physics, biology of all of uh, that scale is the nanoscale. So let me give you a, an example of why the nanoscale is kind of interesting. So silica particles are basically sand grains. They're very tiny sand grains. For, it, it, you can make them very tiny. Uh, on the nanoscale. And so, like sand, they can take a lot of form. So they can be loose, like dry sand, uh, or they can be compressed, uh, like if you took sand and you heated it up and made glass out of it, uh, that would be you know, a form of sand, that's where they're all packed densely together. Or you could arrange the particles such that the, the interior contents are like uh, dandelions, big puff balls. Or you might could arrange them the way something you would find in a, a bowl of Chex Mix might be, where it's sort of hollow in the middle and has a lot of holes in it that things can go, go in and out of. And so the excitement about the nanoscale is that you can arrange things, um, it, the arrangement of molecules at that scale or objects at that scale dictates their physical properties. So where do you find, where would you find nanomaterials in your, in your home? Well, if maybe you woke up this morning you had a grilled cheese sandwich, or maybe you took something a little more healthy, like a, a Greek yogurt. Afterwards, maybe you brushed your teeth. Uh, then perhaps you took a shower, and you put on some deodorant, and then you put on your uh, wrinkle-resistant or water-repellent clothing, and then you noticed it was really sunny out today, and so you put some sunscreen on. In, just in that uh, few hours or minutes, depending on how quickly you do that, uh, in that short period of time, you used an enormous quantity of nanomaterials without really even knowing it. It's a $26 billion a year industry uh, nationwide. And the purpose of the nanomaterials are uh, in the, in the uh, toothpaste and in the yogurt is to make it kind of shiny. So uh, they make it kind of really brilliant and bright white. Uh, and then the deodorant, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, more anti-caking, so that your deodorant doesn't all you know clump up and get cakey when you're we're putting it on. 
So, so, but what's the, so what's the big deal about the nanoscale? That, that seems kind of boring that you just have um, you know, anti-caking or something that makes things white. So uh, let me give you an example of other things that go on at the nanoscale. Okay, let's take uh, a metal like zinc. Uh, zinc is it's a dull gray metal, well, shiny gray, uh, just kind of boring on the, on the nanoscale. So if I had a, a block of zinc here, it would just be kind of gray. And then we could take another metal like uh, cadmium, which is extremely toxic, so you wouldn't want to actually have a chunk of cadmium in your hand, but if you did, it would also be just a gray, gray metal. And then a third metal, like selenium, is also kind of a gray, dull blah. So if you took all those, if you took those blocks of cadmium, zinc, and selenium, and you just mushed them together, you would just have a big gray blah, right? But if you took the zinc, the cadmium, and selenium, and combine them on the nanoscale, then magic happens. They do something interesting. They glow, okay? So they, they do something called fluoresce, or glow in the dark, if you, if you like. Uh, and the, they glow in different colors. And the color that they glow in is dependent on the size. So the very small materials glow uh, purple, and the much larger ones that are more toward the bacterial side, gl uh, they glow red. And then everything in between is sort of a rainbow of colors. Okay, so that's the properties of nanomaterials are very different uh, at the nanoscale than they are at the single molecule level or at the bulk level, which you, know, you could hold in your hand. So that's, that's where all the excitement is in science right now. But cadmium is extremely toxic, right? So you don't want to use a cadmium-based nanomaterial if you were trying to make a medicine or do, do something useful in, in people. So instead, uh, like my lab and others, have looked for biologically compatible nanomaterials, things that are not toxic. And so here's an example of, of a nanomaterial that you may know. Does anyone recognize this double helical nanomaterial? Yeah, DNA, right? So if you said DNA, you're right. It's, uh, it, you might not think of it, but it's, it's on the nanoscale. So the width of the DNA is about two nanometers. And in the example I have uh, shown on the screen, it's about four nanometers, but it, it can, could continue for a very long time. So it's a, it's a very long, thin nanomaterial, right? Well, if you think about it, human beings have been taking long, thin materials uh, for a very, very long time and doing interesting things with them. So if, for example, you are a knitter or a crocheter, uh, you have taken something like yarn and you have manipulated it in such a way as you can make uh, macroscopic objects, like you can make a, a swell t-shirt or a sweatshirt or a, a beanie cap, or you can make a bedspread or a pillowcase out of it, if you knew how to do that. I, I don't, but, uh, but you could if you had that talent. So a few years ago, uh, back in 2006, a scientist from Caltech figured out a way of weaving DNA into two-dimensional objects, right? So he figured out a way that we can take DNA as a nanomaterial and we can weave it into rectangles or squares or stars or little smiley faces or triangles or, you know, and again, these are on the nano scale. So these are very tiny, they're really cute and cool, but they're really small. They're between individual molecules and bacteria, so they're smaller than a bacterium. And if you can, if you can knit a, a smiley face, you can also knit other parts of the body. In fact, you could knit whole uh, robots out of nanomaterials, so things that look like, uh, like humanoid. And you can manipulate them in such a way that they can, they can do things, like a, a robot that's able to dance, for example, by controlling how the, the robot is constructed. So, going back to the fantastic voyage, the future of nanomaterials and drugs made from nanomaterials is not that we're going to be able to take people and use some shrink ray and shrink them down to, to the very small size. We're going to be able to make little people, little robots, that are going to be able to carry out functions, maybe like removing blood clots when they're injected, uh, in, in, to the body, or other carry drugs to certain locations of tissue. So the future of medicine lies at the nanoscale. And so with that, I'd like to wish you a bon voyage.